It's a rare thing in Utah's high desert country. Rain, drenching a sun-baked land. Water is not abundant here, but everywhere you look, you see its handiwork. It changes a timeless landscape subtly, yet forcefully, and leaves behind a scene unlike any other. This terrain has been evolving for eons and is still in flux. We just don't know how long it's going to be there. It's a geological marvel, at once inviting and foreboding, larger than life, yet silent and still, hosting centuries of human existence. There's a real peace and a real magic that's here. And holding mysteries among its canyons. Mostly I think people want to know, what is it? And while the star player rarely makes an appearance, it's water in all of its shapes and forms that makes everything possible here. This is the secret of Arches and Canyonlands National Parks. The iconic American West. A land of canyons, arches, spires, sculpted by water and time and carved by two great rivers, the Green and the Colorado. Today, people come here for the world-class recreation. But this is a place that has beckoned to us for centuries. From the outlaws of the frontier, to fortune seekers and homesteaders, to filmmakers making everything from John Wayne Westerns to Thelma and Louise and Indiana Jones. But while the landscape may resemble something created on a Hollywood backlot, only nature could have created this masterpiece. Arches and canyon lands are part of the Colorado Plateau, a huge chunk of continental crust that covers much of eastern Utah, parts of Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. Only 30 miles separate both parts, but geologically, they're ages apart. What's amazing and really convenient is that we have two parks that are so close together, yet have such different geological features. The more you stand around here, you, you start to see that the rock really has a story of its own and it's really evolving. And that story begins with water and time and gravity, the main components of erosion. Arches National Park is a prime example of erosion in action. Its fins, arches, balanced rocks, and spires were gradually sculpted over thousands of years. But how did it happen, and why here? Arches National Park sits on top of vast underground salt beds, remnants of ancient oceans. Over eons, erosion from nearby mountains covered the salt with sediment. Pressure from this overlying rock squeezed the salt underneath into a dome. Eventually, movement from within the earth bent the rock, which split into long parallel cracks, setting the stage for arch formation. As water seeped through these cracks, it dissolved the underlying salt. This caused the rock to collapse into a valley. Along the valley's edges, cracks in the rock continued to erode, leaving behind thin sandstone walls called fins as weathering forces, like freezing and thawing, attacked weak areas of the fin, chunks of rock fell out. Eventually, an arch formed. But the story doesn't end here. The red sandstone layer that you see all over Arches National Park is so prone to erosion that the park's many formations continue to develop even today. It's an excruciatingly slow process, at least in human terms. The life of an arch can span thousands of years. But arches don't live forever. The same elements that create these graceful structures also lead to their demise. So here we are at Landscape Arch. It's one of the largest arches in the world, uh, 306 feet long, so actually longer than a football field. Um, also one of the oldest, and we know that because it's so thin and fragile. In 1991, a chunk of Landscape Arch fell off without warning, surprising a group of visitors with a camera. All of a sudden, we heard this crack. It was just like lightning hit a tree right next to us. And we ran over, and a 73-foot-long slab had fallen from right in the center area. Landscape Arch is now just six feet thick at its thinnest point. I do tell everyone that visits the park, make sure to get to Landscape Arch, because we just don't know how long it's going to be there. Another must-see is the unofficial state symbol of Utah, Delicate Arch. The remnant of an ancient fin, 
Delicate Arch sits alone in a natural red rock amphitheater. Delicate is a fitting name for this arch, but it's been known by many names, including Old Maid's Bloomers and Cowboy Chaps. American pioneers and early visitors named many formations in a classic case of, call it like you see it, Balanced Rock, The Three Gossips, Windows. These fantastic formations inspire imaginations to run wild. Today, visitors can see most of the popular formations along park roads and on short walks. Longer trails reveal a few hidden gems. And who knows, you may even discover an arch yourself. So somebody was asking earlier if the park's all been discovered and explored, but we're still finding changes, still finding new things. While Native Americans have been traversing these canyons for thousands of years, Western settlers are relative newcomers. They didn't reach the high desert interior until the late 1800s. The remoteness of this part of the West and the inhospitable climate were daunting, making it one of the last places to be populated by non-native people. Ranchers were some of the first to settle the harsh terrain. This one-room cabin near the Delicate Arch Trailhead was home to one such family. It still stands after more than a century and offers a glimpse into an earlier time when life was simpler, but survival was more difficult. Cowboys also roam these lands, searching for pasture. But perhaps the most intriguing figure of Western expansion is a one-armed Civil War veteran who is more interested in exploring than in settling. John Wesley Powell is credited with opening up this part of the West. In 1869, Powell led expeditions down the Green and Colorado Rivers into completely unknown territory. His extensive notes shed light on the last unmapped part of the continental U.S. Powell's journey led him to the confluence of the Green and Colorado Rivers, in the heart of what is now Canyonlands National Park. Canyonlands is a product of the same basic geological forces that created arches, but here, the rivers are the principal architects. More than five million years ago, tectonic movements in the Earth's crust caused the Colorado Plateau to rise, pushing the once low-lying area to 5,000 feet above sea level. With this uplift, the Colorado and Green River systems, as we know them today, were created. The rivers relentlessly cut down through the rock layers, exposing older and older rocks, some layers that had been deposited more than 300 million years ago. They carved canyons more than 2,000 feet deep and sliced canyon lands into its three districts. Island in the Sky is the highest part of the park and the most accessible. This mesa rises over the park's rivers and canyons, providing spectacular views. The Needles District's unearthly terrain is like a living geology lesson. Its red and white spires are the remnants of sand dunes and river sediments millions of years old. And the Maze District, one of the most remote areas in the United States. The Maze is a labyrinth of canyons and fins. This is Canyonlands at its wildest. This land would seem the last place anyone would try to call home. But archaeologists have found evidence of human presence here as far back as 12,000 years ago, when prehistoric hunters stalked mammoth and other large prey. And perhaps 9 to 10,000 years later, another ancient people left tantalizing clues to their presence. In a remote section of Canyonland's Maze District, sheer cliff walls protect some of the most incredible pictograph panels in existence. It's about a three and a quarter mile hike down a hot sandy wash to get there, but uh, it's worth every footstep. These panels are now called the Great Gallery, and archaeologists say a nomadic hunter-gatherer people left them at least 2,000 years ago. But why here? Some people say it's because of the preservation qualities of this alcove, or maybe it had really spiritual significance to the people there. But again, we don't know, and that's the beauty of it. It's the mystery. In more recent times, this labyrinth of rocks served a less lofty purpose. For more infamous characters, 19th century outlaws and bandits looking to escape the law found Canyon Country to be an ideal hideout. 
Butch Cassidy and his wild bunch holed up in an area just west of Canyonland's Maze District. A lawman didn't really want to come into because it was unfamiliar territory, and so they really didn't feel comfortable coming in after Butch, and so he felt pretty safe here. Butch and his gang were some of the most feared bank and train robbers in history. They evaded capture in these confusing canyons until the frontier closed, and they rode out of the west and into legend. The area that is now Canyonlands National Park remained largely inaccessible until after World War II, when the search for uranium prompted miners to build roads here. The miners found very little uranium ore, but the roads remain. And with roads came tourists, because for the first time it was possible to see much of Canyonlands by car. With tourists came geologists, who discovered that Canyonlands has some very intriguing features. This one has left them scratching their heads. Circular features like that are fairly rare on the Earth's surface. Upheaval Dome is a huge crater, measuring one and a half miles across. Scientists can't seem to agree on how it got here. Some believe it was created by ancient salt flows. We know that there are underlying salt beds in the area. What we would be looking at with that kind of an origin is perhaps that the salt had domed up and, and, a, and a bubble of salt had peeled off, rather like a lava lamp. Another possibility? A major meteorite crash millions of years ago. With a meteorite impact, what you'd have is some large asteroid or comet coming down, impacting the surface, and some of it gets vaporized and blown out like an explosion. Upheaval Dome may always remain a mystery. This land doesn't give up its secrets easily. Even evidence of the dinosaurs that once roamed here is well hidden. And among the arches and fins, canyons and mesas, an eerie silence prevails. To newcomers, arches and canyonlands can seem desolate, even lifeless. But nothing could be further from the truth. Life flourishes here, adapted to this harsh environment. Here, even the soil is alive. Biological soil crust is a mass of lichens, fungi, mosses, and cyanobacteria. It may not look like much, but it's crucial to keeping the land intact. It holds moisture in, adds nutrients to the soil, and resists erosion, enabling plants to grow where they otherwise couldn't. It's also extremely delicate. Once destroyed, it can take up to 250 years to fully recover. The wildlife has also adapted to flourish in the desert. Many larger animals, like bighorn sheep, sleep during the hottest part of the day, coming out to graze when it's cooler. And the kangaroo rat doesn't even need to drink water. It can extract water out of the food it eats. Plants and animals go to great lengths to survive here, proof that humans should not take this environment lightly. But with a little preparation and plenty of drinking water, arches and canyonlands are an adventurer's dream. Hike miles of seemingly unexplored terrain. Bike canyonlands white rim trail. Raft the wild rapids of Cataract Canyon. Or simply lose yourself in the wonder of endless winding canyons and soaring arches. To experience arches and canyonlands is to come face to face with the primal forces of nature. This is a land where nature's contrasts are at their most extreme. An arid desert where, ironically, water is the key player. It's not easy to find here, but it sets everything in motion. A force of creation and destruction, which continues, slowly but inevitably, to shape the land. The spectacular formations of arches and canyonlands are geology in slow motion. And just as they formed, these places will, in time, erode away. Time has gone on. We have seen these fins form in the cracks. And more time has passed before we even got here that these arches are being formed. And we're here where we can see these incredible things. And these things aren't always going to be here. That's the magic and the message of this piece of the American West. Nature will continue to follow its own path, by its own design, in its own time.